Welcome to Bike Life Radio from KWNK 97.7 FM, Reno Bike Project, NevadaBike.org, and BikeWashow.org in Reno, Nevada. We ride our bikes out into the world with a recorder, and we talk to people about their bikes and their lives. I'm Kai Plaskon, right on. Today we're talking about how people don't ride bikes because they're afraid of getting a ticket, and laws that are sweeping the nation to try and change that. First, the news. In international bike news, can you ride with no hands? Well, if you can, what do you do with your hands? <laughs> well, a guy in India made Turkish coffee with his hands uh, as he rode with no hands. Uh, he was riding his bike with no hands and he put a piece of wood on his handlebars and then he laid down a tiny tablecloth and he assembled a propane burner and he put it on this piece of wood in the tablecloth and then he puts down a Turkish cup with ground coffee. He boils it and hands it off to a guy who's standing by the side of the road, all while riding his bike with no hands. It, uh, this video has gone viral. His mom must be very proud. Look, mom, no hands. Imagine a two-story tall sculpture of a face made of bike chains. Imagine a rusty face and a shiny face. No, you don't have to imagine anymore. A South Korean artist is making these things. His name is Seo. There's a new European declaration on cycling. It's from the European Parliament uh, Transportation Committee that covers all of the European Union. The declaration says a lot of stuff, but mainly that anyone, regardless of physical ability, should have access to mobility, and cycling is a good way to have that freedom of mobility. The idea is that the declaration will encourage EU governments to think about it and do it. In national bike news, you have to take a drunk test before you can rent a bike in Phoenix, Arizona late at night. It's called a reaction test. Phoenix didn't like late night bike share because of drunk people potentially riding, but now due to high demand, they're making bike share 24 seven and adding this reaction test to hopefully stop drunk people who might get on a bike. Don't like bike lanes? Well, then file a lawsuit. That's what some people in Cambridge, Massachusetts did. They were trying to stop a 25 mile protected bike network. They lost and the bike network is moving forward. The lesson, don't try to stop protected bike networks. Speaking of protected bike networks, there's a buffered lane in Florida. That means two white lines instead of one white line. Well, a 60 year old guy was riding there when a sheriff in a truck hit and killed him. The sheriff won't face any charges. Why? Well, the report says the sheriff wasn't reckless. That's even though he was driving 84 miles an hour in a 55 mile per hour zone. You're listening to KWNK 97.7 FM in local bike news from Bike Life Radio, the Reno Bike Project, NevadaBike.org, and BikeWashoe.org. Millions of dollars that was supposed to go to safe routes for schools for kids in Washoe County is instead being used for a freeway sound wall. That's after the Washoe County School District didn't find matching funds for federal money to improve student safety. This is all according to an article in the Reno Gazette Journal. Ever wish that all the bike people could get together in one place at one time and talk about bikes? <laughs> well, that's the goal of the Reno Public Market with Biketopia 2. It's on April 27th from 4 to 7 p.m. April 27th. We're going to have tables from bike shops and interviews with them. Put down your bike and get great food. Play a silly game to win bottles of wine for a dollar and maybe even a Burning Man ticket. The Kiwanis Bike Program has their Pairings for Programs fundraiser on March 8th from 6 to 9 p.m. at the Reno Elks Lodge. Tickets are available at Eventbrite. Search Pairings for Programs. Reno bike advocates will hit the stage in Washington, D.C. and storm the halls of Congress in March. The Nevada Bicycle Coalition and Truckee Meadows Bicycle Alliance will be presenting at the National Bike Summit with experts from around the nation and world. We're going to talk about how the Dutch Cycling Embassy visit led the city of Reno to go from no protected bike lanes downtown to a proposal for more than six miles of protected bike network. The second annual Ride Reno Spin Sparks is on. It's a bike ride for kids, families, and people who want to ride their bike. That's you. <laughs> the event was recommended by the League of American Bicyclists to highlight protected paths in our area. 
This year, it is sponsored by County Commissioner Mary Luz Garcia, who is putting in $5,000 to make the whole thing free. But she's also spending her valuable time helping to bring everyone together. Up to 300 people are expected to ride. Mark your calendars, May 18th, 10 a.m. Start at Bernice Matthews Elementary. Ride Reno, spin, spark, 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 sparks. See you there. That's it for local bike news from NevadaBike.org, Reno Bike Project, BikeWashoe.org, and Bike Life Radio. We air the first Sunday of every month at noon right here on KWNK 97.7 FM. I'm Kai Plaskon, right on. Today on Bike Life Radio, we will talk about how people don't want to go out on bikes because they might get a ticket, and how there are laws sweeping the nation to try and change that. But first, bike music. Here is Walter Schrieffel's The Bicycle Song. But this song is about my bicycle back in New York that got stolen. And, uh, and I'm still looking for the motherfucker that stole it. But I got it back for a minute, and then I lost it again. But I wrote a song about it. It's called Bicycle Song. Where is my bicycle stolen away? Will I see you again riding by me someday? With your new rider as ill-gotten gain when I picture you together, it just fills my heart with pain. I wish we could be reunited. The days turn the weeks into months, into years. Retrace the steps, walk the trail of my tears. I'm fixed on your memory, a sticker to your frame. My search for you's continuing, I hope it's not in vain I wish we could be reunited Though finding you again seems so unlikely to happen I wish we could be reunited My bicycle and me Riding by the beach at Coney Island Maybe a messenger, Chinese delivery bar, downtown our student. Be careful what you do with my bicycle. I righteously It's not the end. <laughs> From the depths of my despair, a miracle occurred. As I was walking down 11th Street, my bicycle appeared. I ran out the driver, clever thief, the gig is up. I ran my fastest, but I wasn't fast enough. I wish we could be reunited. Love finding you again seems so unlikely to happen. I wish we could be reunited. My bicycle and me riding down the streets again together. That was Walter Schrieffel's The Bicycle Song. You're listening to Bike Life Radio on KWNK 97.7 FM in Reno from the Reno Bike Project on Grove Street, Nevada Bicycle Coalition, and Truckee Meadows Bicycle Alliance. I'm Kai Plaskon. Right on. Today on Bike Life Radio, in preparation of going to the National Bike Summit in Washington, D.C. this month, we're exploring a national trend to decriminalize bike behavior and other things, too. 
We will talk to advocates who are on this nationwide bike bandwagon from Boston, Rochester, Minnesota, and Washington, D.C. We'll start with Seth Grimes of Tacoma Park, Maryland. That's a suburb of D.C. He's with the Washington Area Bicycle Association. Here is how he got started in bike advocacy. Uh, for instance, we have a bicycle master plan that was enacted in Montgomery County in 2018. And I commented on that, that it didn't address bike parking, which was then added because you can't just have bike paths and lanes and trails. You need a place for people to park their bikes. Yeah, that must have been really inspiring for you to not be like an official advocate and then for you to say this thing. And then they're like, yeah, we need bike parking, right? <laughs> It's always thrilling when uh, people who are in positions of power take up your ideas and adopt them officially. But my advocacy, I've been an advocate for decades, working in a whole variety of stuff in justice and immigration issues and environmental issues and so on. I also served two terms on the city council of the city where I live which exposes you to all sorts of things, including things that you don't agree with or think are a good idea. So uh, yeah, I've been doing this for quite a while. That is Seth Grimes in Washington, D.C., talking about how he got started in bike advocacy. Also on the line, we had Galen Mook of Mass Bike, the Massachusetts advocacy group. So here is why we came and brought them all together. When you think about going out uh, to ride a bike, you might ride kind of like drivers drive, rolling through stop signs. But unlike drivers, cyclists expend a huge amount of energy when they have to stop and then start again. So they tend to just ride right through stop signs. You've probably seen it before and maybe you've done it yourself. And they do that if it's safe for the most part. But that makes riders afraid of being targeted and stopped and ticketed by police. As you can imagine, getting a big fat ticket is a major barrier to going on a fun bike ride. So there is a national effort to protect cyclists from that. And it's pretty simple. It's called Stop as Yield or Safety Stop. And we're in conversations with the Regional Transportation Commission of Las Vegas to put this in action right here in Nevada. Here's Seth to explain. And later you're going to hear from Galen Mook of Mass Bike, too. Here is our conversation. We are talking about bicycle safety yield. That is because a common objection we get when we talk about things like stop as yield, in other words, bicyclists going through a stop sign without stopping, is how terrible bicyclists are on the road. They don't obey the road laws and so on. And our key point with this legislation is that it makes traversing intersections safer for bicyclists, and it also reduces some of the stress for drivers if you don't have to wait for a bicyclist to accelerate from a stop to cross an intersection. So we are not calling it stop as yield anymore. We are calling it bicycle safety yield. The convincing argument here is that the federal government's safety organization has explained that bicyclists proceeding without stopping through a stop sign is safer for bicyclists and for everyone on the road. That there's also, you know, people are like, ah, it's the federal government, they made it up or whatever. And I, they are. Uh, yeah, the, <laughs> and so what I like to do is, is really explain it from a cyclist perspective. And, and uh, so, you know, from a cyclist perspective, one of the most dangerous places to be is an intersection. And so the sooner you can get through it and not stand in it, then the less danger you're in. And I don't know if that resonates or not. Uh, Galen, do you have any, any thoughts on that? Or, or Seth, you know, as cyclists, like, do you want to get out of there as quickly as possible because it's a dangerous place to be? Well, I think I'll jump in. I think the, the there's the very important fact that science backs this up. So to Seth's point, the NHTSA studies are showing that where safe bicycling intersection, however we're framing it, um, no longer stop as yield has been implemented statewide. We've seen crashes reduced at intersections in particular. So the data is there like that. That is fine to, to lean into. But I also think the kind of emotional and subjective experience of people on the road, when we are uh, vulnerable, when we are not protected by you know steel and airbags and seatbelts, we have to do whatever we can to do what is safest in the moment. And I always tell people that the law is the law and the law is there for a reason, for safety. However, the law is you know, a blunt object and it can't cover literally everything. So that's why we have the judicial system as interpretation. So my 
quote that I like to have is, do whatever is safest for you in the moment. Know what the law is. Know that you might be breaking a citation, breaking the law, might get a citation for it. However, your safety is paramount. So whatever is safest for you in the moment, that's how you should act. Um, and that definitely comes down to when you're next to a large vehicle in particular, a truck, a bus, a school bus, a dump truck, or a semi truck, and you're adjacent to them, parallel to them at an intersection, you are incredibly vulnerable. You are in a lot of danger if the driver decides to make a turn, um, if other drivers who aren't seeing you. So yeah, I think the idea of coming to a full stop, putting a foot down, and then putting the foot back on the pedal. Some people aren't familiar with that kind of power pedal start. They might start wobbly. Uh, they're not up to speed. It is a, a danger zone for, for folks. And so I think yeah, I, it's it's hard to convince folks who might not have that visceral experience because maybe they don't bike, maybe they aren't there at these crucial intersections. However, it is still incumbent on those who are out there to do whatever's safest for them in the moment. So that's that's kind of how I approach it. But I'm very curious about how it's been going in your neck of the woods and what arguments have also been um, hitting and striking chords. Seth? I certainly can talk about personal perspectives. So, for instance, my own practice has been to not stop it stop signs uh, if the coast is clear, what this bill would do. For that matter, I will stop and proceed through a red traffic light if there's other traffic, cross traffic there. That is something that we considered pursuing and decided that was going too far, that uh, let's get the bicycle safety stop at stop signs first. Uh, so in any case, you know, my experience includes stopping at an intersection on my bicycle, staying to the right of the road like a good bicyclist is supposed to, and then being crowded out by a motor vehicle that has decided to pull up to the intersection far too close to me. Uh, you know, that wouldn't have happened if I hadn't had to stop. And and I fell over in the incident that I can that I'm thinking of here. I mean, we've all had incidents of one type or another. So yeah, I agree, Galen, uh, that the safety situation is best judged by bicyclists, but I think a maybe the majority of drivers see us as road nuisances, slowing them down, not entitled to be on the road, all that kind of stuff. Which one of us hasn't been yelled at, get off the road if you're on the bicycle and you're taking up the full lane is, is your right. Um, so we are not treated, uh, we are vulnerable road users, but we're not treated the same. We're not seen the same as pedestrians. With pedestrians, there's much less question of yielding, although there's plenty of bad driver behavior and failure to yield there. So, you know, it's a there's a lot of driver education that needs to go on. Passing road safety laws like this one that we're discussing is good, but we also need to redesign our roadways to protect, create protected infrastructure uh, for bicyclists. Uh, it's only part of a larger solution. Uh, we have the hearing for the Maryland bill coming up the, the hearing is just testimony, it's not discussion, coming up next week. And after that, it will go to committee and there will be uh, not very visible discussions within committee. We do have a hint. Uh, we, as a matter of strategy, have been working with the Maryland Department of Transportation on a variety of bills to try to win their support, or if they aren't supporting them, they're not in opposition. We actually have a hint that the Maryland Transportation Secretary is favorable to this bill, which will be hugely helpful to us. We're, we're working on other angles as well. One of them is to see whether we can recruit some law enforcement support. That would be immensely helpful to have law enforcement senior uh, personnel up there testifying uh, that they like this as well. There are a number of reasons. One is that the less uh, stuff like this that they have to enforce the better it is for them and the more they can focus on other things. That's a kind of a facile argument. But at the same time, if we can get them to recognize that the data shows that this is going to create safety, law enforcement personnel are public safety personnel uh, at the core, or at least they should be. So that's another angle for us in trying to build support. So to answer your question, Clyde, it's unclear yet, but we have a lot of good signs. This is KWNK 97.7 FM Bike Life Radio. Let's take a break. Here is Bicycle by Turbo. T-S-S-T T-Double Turbo Vagnum, what up? What up? I got this. Got it? Yeah. Let's get into it. Yeah. Look, look. 
I'm up in here like lights, this is nice like a little boy yeah. Giving the old lady a teddy bear, huh? I'm hyped like a little boy when the old lady buy him a bike The mic I'm pedaling I handle bars like handlebars Turn them around 360 degrees I'm equipping the beat with a gyro So I got reversible flow Flow reversible Got I so gyro oh. So I got reversible flow I turn it back around Back around I turn it Don't be concerned with the hotness Coming from the hot flow Something like a hot cone Burning the edge of your perm It's so slick like a pimp named Slickback Say my whole name yeah. T double turbo the battle toe Steadily sc- sc- scramble with the scrambling tame Man, big ups to young streets Down in LA, trendsetter They say, Sheesh. get cheddar, spin cheddar Any day of the week So yeah. I didn't have a cheddar to pay for them beats So, good looks What up? Vagnum, I'm a spaz on this track, son. Yeah. I don't need a hook. Nah. If I did need a hook, uh. I'd probably kill the hook. What? Like a crocodile. Oh. I'm snapping these pirate actors in these haters' sight. Yeah. You see, they trying to steal my swag, but, but they'll never land a good flow. Why not? It's too bad. Yeah. They'll never land in my crew in the booth. We know that they just wanna bees. Call them Rufio. Oh. So I'm the pan now. Yeah. The pot in the skillet spit hot. You can fill it up with ice cold liquid in the heat of this beat. Will remain yeah. in my brain. Yeah. I cannot stop yeah. rhyming. My rhythm is a prison, uh, and I gotta do uh, my time. Yeah. The cell block is made of the cells uh, in my mind, which uh, point out my power to excel with rhyming. Oh. Access my info path as I graph these bars. It's easy as I draw a line from my mind to the mic To the CD, to the speakers in your stereo I'm never on your TV cause I stay low key Like a legend on the map I'm a legend on the track like Michael Johnson For real? Yes, a gold medalist Like I said earlier, sir, I'm gon' pedal this Yes, like a yellow wrist band That's on my left wrist Man, I gotta live strong Can't be weak any day of the week I beat the beat like a fist stand Hop off the track, put my kickstand down I'm out Turbo with their song Bicycle. Let's get back to our interview. Uh, I, I'm going to bring in one other public safety argument here, which is that I'm in the Washington, D.C. area. What I'm about to say applies all throughout the United States. Uh, we have a racist policing system. We have high rates of traffic stops. We have people in motor vehicles and for black people, people of color, uh, often, far too often, those stops are pretextual. They're used for searches for weapons or uh, drugs based on racial profiling. Uh, Too often they escalate into violent situations. If we can reduce the number of police stops, for instance, by removing the the pretext of of a police officer stopping a bicyclist for not stopping at a stop sign, then that's a good thing. And that's an argument that we make as well, which is an effective argument in our jurisdiction. The And that is something that we're worried about here is, you know, maybe subconsciously uh, law enforcement might say, you know, well, we like to be able to pull over people on bikes if we need to, because, you know, and we don't have a real good reason unless they ran a stop sign and didn't put their foot down. Um, and so the... Uh, the arguments uh, about that are very, very important, uh, especially if we ended up with law enforcement opposition. Yeah. So, you know, this NHTSA, NHTSA has a two page fact sheet mm. and that is as effective as something to hand people as anything that we put together is going to be. So we, we do both. We have our own fact sheet that pertains particularly to the legislation at hand, but we also have this government fact sheet and I will send you a citation for that if you don't have it. The concept of focusing on a legislative package kind of brings it to a state level, or I guess in D.C. it's a city-state. Um, and, you know, it's, it's interesting to think about what mechanisms can be done legislatively, where a lot of bike advocates are like, oh, I want a bike lane, or I want my pothole filled, or whatever, which is kind of a municipal conversation. Or they're like, oh, I want a, this bridge to be expanded to get, you know, a, a shared-use path, which is probably federal dollars. 
So what are we talking about that's actually a statewide purview? A lot of it is the laws in terms of, you know, what is allowed, where you can ride, can you ride on a sidewalk? Um, what is uh, an offense? So for instance, you know, for state police or municipal police, they definitely follow state laws more than federal laws in terms of their purview and jurisdiction. So it's, it's a couple of, you know, core ideas that a lot of us at this level, this strata of bike advocacy have to focus on. And I really appreciate Seth that you're mentioning the ways in which cycling and enforcement overlap with the greater enforcement conversation. Um, recently in Massachusetts, we just got a law that would require a rear light for cyclists after night. Uh, prior, it was a reflector or a light. Now it's a reflector and a light. Small change, a single word change, but that has huge implications for, is this going to be something that is a primary offense, which means can police officers pull people over? And then if that's the case, are we going to keep an eye on the, the judicial, I mean, the, uh, the racial markers of it? So our argument to Seth's point about how we can focus on this is we actually added a half a sentence to the statute. You're we like, hey, you want to put a cyclist with a light? We agree. It's important for safety. However, it cannot be used as pretext for pulling over a cyclist. So in the law, we were actually able to put in statute. Police officers cannot use it as a primary offense. It can only be cited after a cyclist has been stopped for another offense. So it's finding ways of finding mechanisms like that to get at the greater issues sometimes. It's that's really interesting. <clears throat> um, you know, because we're often so focused on getting more people to cycle. Uh, meanwhile, we might not be looking at some of the underlying reasons why people don't. Like, if I get on this bike and I ride it, I'm going to get pulled over. And uh, and that's a, a real disincentive to riding, potentially. Totally. Yeah. So. So, so we don't just pursue legislation. Uh, there are a variety of organizations that give out free lights. You know, they're not hugely expensive, but... Uh, some people, you know, even an expense of $30 to get a front and rear light is going to be uh, a little bit of a stretch. So it's not just about legislation. It's about assisting bicyclists in other ways. And a lot of our efforts are around creating a so-called low-stress bicycling network. Uh, network is key. You have to have connectivity, ways to get from one place to another. Forcing people into the street for a few blocks means you don't have a network, means they don't have that level of comfort. We're pursuing other ways to get people on bicycles. Um, so my organization has uh, learned a bicycle training for kids, for adults. They do it in schools, on contracts to local governments. Yeah, we do that. But one of the key things that we're promoting, both uh, through state legislation and I'm promoting in the two counties that I cover, is creating e-bike purchase subsidy programs. There are great programs in Colorado and Denver, uh, in California, uh, there are plenty of models out there, but the point is that e-bikes are transformational. A lot of people are not comfortable on a bicycle, especially if they have to go uphill, uh, especially if they, you know, I, on my way into work, I go into work uh, a few times a week. I pass people commuting, take bringing their little kids to school, to preschool on the back of a cargo bike. E-bikes are transformational, so we're promoting e-bike purchase subsidy programs. Uh, you know, just ways to get people on bicycles and uh, yeah. So where do you where do you get your money? <laughs> how do how do we do that to uh, um, somehow have a paid advocate in the state of Nevada? I'm going to tell you how my position was funded originally. I was funded by two road debts, so it's uh, story got a lot of attention around the country in August of 2022. A woman named Sarah Dubbin Glangenkamp was killed on a state highway in Montgomery County. Her husband uh, and she are both State Department diplomats. Uh, he raised a lot of money and funded safety efforts at three different organizations, one of which was WABA. I am also have been funded by the Bega Memorial Fund. Uh, a guy named Sean Blumenthal was killed on the roads. This is very sad to hear, uh, but it's it's out there. Uh, we also have members. We have plenty of members who are uh, maybe for the term mammals. Uh, 
Men in Lycra spandex. Yeah, middle-aged men in Lycra spandex. Uh, well, you know, uh, we got plenty of those, but we also have just people who uh, are everyday bikers who join because they like what we're doing. But that's the environment that we're in. It might be a bit different in Nevada. We do get some foundation money, some corporate sponsorships and so on. And we have fundraising events, some so, several of the year that are fundraisers run but now we've been able to tap into funding sources that cover public health um, that do cover sustainable transportation um, some climate concerns that are foundation supported there's a lot of overlap there um, and then to Seth's point about uh, members we probably about a third of our budget comes from individual donors which is a, a good support structure because they don't just give money, they'll write letters or show up to meetings and kind of help us on our grassroots advocacy. Um, and then we have some fee for service like the classes and workshops as well. So if there's a way in which you can generate revenue running bike rodeos for the school system or even running, you know, learn to rides for adults, uh, when there is funding there, especially if it's geared around transportation safety. Police departments generally have dollars for community outreach that they could lend to running a rodeo. So just kind of building a revenue generation out of kind of an event based as well. And I've also seen organizations like Bike Texas, for instance, generate some good revenue with their bike valet. They'll lend out their bike valet racks. So it's a low staff cost, but because they have the product and they can rent it out for, you know, an hourly rate, they'll kind of generate revenue that way and you do that for a few years when you're in the in the black then you can kind of fund a position like Seth's and then prove the efficacy to the, uh, the people who have the purse string whether it's official through a department or whether it's a foundation or whether it's an individual I feel like there's a lot of overlap right now how biking can hit a lot of serious challenges out there in the world I mean we talked already about racist policing but you know there's also the, the climate crisis the existential dread of where we're going to go with greenhouse gas emissions or growth in an urban area that is already at capacity on a roadway or a transit system. You can find a lot of overlap with bicycling to fit some of the, you know, the real challenges that people are out there trying to solve. And, you know, some people solve those problems with money. So you've got to be there to position yourself as a, as a bicycling support system to make sure that your work is on their radar. Any experience trying to assist or uh i guess ask for safety measures in rural areas that that you'd like to share yeah i can speak a little bit from massachusetts's perspective because we do have a split of urban which gets a lot of the attention but the rural is mainly dealing with what we call vehicular cycle so how do we get drivers to be educated knowing that we're never going to have separated infrastructure where a cyclist is not interacting with the driver. So with what we're doing in Massachusetts, we have a lot of road campaigns that are uh, in partnership with AAA. Um, ironically or unironically, you know, we're all in this together. So we work with AAA to do mailers, to do signage, um, to do social media campaigns, et cetera. And we're also really trying to focus on driver training. So one of the hooks that we have is at the RMV, some people call it the DMV, but the Registry of Motor Vehicles, where we can kind of get in as an advocacy organization of Mass Bike, get into the curriculum. And I think that's going to help the understanding of at least there will be something that the advocates have led with in the messaging around vulnerability, around the need for all of us to share the road together. But I think, you know, in short, it really is rural communities, there's not been the ability to have separation for the most part. So it's, you know, windy roads, single lane roads, and it is about being aware. So uh, it's driver behavior for the most part. Uh, and I guess lastly, I'd like you to share a, uh, a, a story, any kind of, uh, you know, one of the things we do on Bike Life Radio is we talk about a, uh, a personal story that you may have of uh, either writing or it can be an advocacy, something you might find interesting to the general public out there. You, you got a story, Seth, that you want to share? Yeah, you know, uh, I think that we've all been in this situation or close to it. I, I was pasted by a pickup truck three months ago in the end of October. I was riding in the District of Columbia, I was riding to work. I was in a bike lane in a traffic circle. Traffic circles are great for keeping cars moving. Uh, the driver was cited for failure to yield. It was one of these huge modern pickup trucks with a very high hood. It was actually an older driver 
Uh, and, you know, he said he didn't see me and all that. Uh, these large vehicles are often associated with uh, limited mobility. So there are interesting points here, which is that I am absolutely convinced someone posted after I put this on Twitter that that model of pickup truck has a collision detection and avoidance uh, or avoidance system. I'm absolutely convinced that the vehicle's automatic braking kicked in uh, because uh, the velocity I was hit didn't seem to match the velocity of approach. Uh, and then I will say that I, within a few weeks, the District of Columbia had green striped the bicycle lanes in the intersections. Um, and I have to believe that was the result of my getting hit there and, and you know, publicizing it and so on. We all have these stories. I got off on this relatively lightly, uh, but there are too many people who don't. And we, we want to change that. And we can't let that kind of stuff uh, eliminate the joy of actually getting on a bicycle and the freedom of mobility for those of us who do want to travel that way. Very cool. Excellent. All right, Galen, you got a story? Oh, good question. Um, what is my story? Um, I'll do a little light story. I think, you know, for your Nevada listeners, you might not quite understand the needs of winter riding. But um, I'll just throw it out there that I got my winter bike all nice and tuned up, which means studded tires, new cabling, just kind of getting ready to bear the elements when we're out here, because I use it as my day-to-day -day gut around. Um, and I think one of the joys, I'll put, I'll put a bike joy out here for you, Kai, was... Uh, we don't get a lot of snow anymore, thanks to the changing climate. But just the other day, we did get just enough to get about a half an inch on the ground. So you get that crunch under the tires, and it's coming down in big flakes. So I think for me, my experience all throughout there is the, in all weather, it's still a joyful experience to get out on two wheels. And um, riding along the Charles River, having the blue herons out there in the, in the water, having the big snowflakes come down kind of reminded me of the joy of why we do what we do. Yeah, I'm just feeling joyful listening to it. The other part that was cool is that you mentioned your studded tires and, and just for a visual for our listeners, that's like the punk version of it. You got spikes on your wheels and you know, right? No. <laughs> I'll, take it. I'll take it. Yeah, from mammals to punks. <laughs> when, uh, when I was in Alaska, um, the studded tires didn't exist and we started the fat tire thing up there with uh, taking two rims and putting them together and then threading wow. the the, uh, the spokes. But then we also took screws and <laughs> screwed them through the tires, uh, you know, out so that we had studded tires back then. That was a long time ago. But, That's intense. Uh, yeah, it was very intense. And But the crunching was, uh, was one of my favorite things because it meant that you had some traction. Thanks for sharing and, and thanks for being on Bike Life Radio. I really appreciate you guys. Great. Thanks for the conversation. All right. Thanks, thanks to you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. That was Galen Mook of Mass Bike and Seth Grimes of Washington, D.C., who are trying to pass legislation to decriminalize things that make bike riding easier, like letting bike riders just go through a stop sign if it's safe. Next, we're going to talk to Eric Noonan, the communications director for We Bike Rochester in Minnesota. His group has already passed legislation like this, and he's coming to live in Las Vegas. Before we get to that, how about some music? Here is I'm Going Back on My Bicycle by Galloway Gaelic. The day was fine and the sun did shine, but now it's near the evening. And I was driving in my car, not far from near at Bryden. I just had paid the road tax and fire and theft insurance. When the petrol tank said, that's all frank, and this is my conclusion. I'm going back on the bicycle, I just can't pay the bills. I'm going back on the bicycle, three wheel down. My Aunt Jen, she took me in with her barney and her lingo She said that she would buy the juice if I took her to the bingo Well, all she ever gives to me are lollipops and spangles If she wants to go tomorrow, she can sit up on the handles For I'm going back on the bicycle, I just can't pay the bills I'm going back on the bicycle, three wheel down You 
won't go far without the car Our soul set on the Joneses And I was crawling to the bank Would you please give me a loan, sir? I curse the day I made my way Behind those windscreen wipers With oil strikes and petrol strikes I can't pay the piper But I'm going back on the bicycle I just can't pay the bills I'm going back on the bicycle pounds I earn each year, two thousand hours I'm striving, and a thousand pounds I spend on fifteen thousand miles of driving. Now a ten mile drive takes a one hour stride, if you can get my meaning, and ten miles an hour I could beat on the bike free wheeling. I'm going back on the bicycle, I just can't pay the bills, I'm going back on the bicycle, free wheel down. I'm going back on the bicycle, I just can't pay the bills. I'm going back on the bicycle, a free wheel down the hill. That was Galloway Gaelic. I'm going back on my bicycle. This is KWNK 97.7 FM Bike Life Radio. Let's get back to our interview with Eric Noonan, Communications Director for We Bike Rochester. So statewide, Minnesota last year um, actually legalized uh, uh, stop as yield. So the the non uh, red light portion of the Idaho stop. You're uh, you're coming out here to Nevada, right? Yeah, no, I'll be following uh, my spouse. Uh, I'm a military spouse and we'll be moving out there. Uh, she's a pulmonary cr- critical care specialist and um, we'll be relocating to Las Vegas uh, early summer. And what do you want to do? I'm hoping to continue a lot of the work that I have been doing here, which has been a lot of uh, transportation equity and climate organizing. Nice. Uh, work and um, kind of hopefully having some 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 same impacts that I've been able to have um, in, in this community and in this state. Um, you know, out there in Nevada and the Las Vegas area. Yeah, I got to tell you that um, I'm not all that familiar familiar with what is happening in Vegas. Uh, we just restarted the uh, Nevada Bicycle Coalition, which is the statewide coalition. Um, Nevada Bicycle Coalition, which was originally the parent of the Truckee Meadows Bicycle Alliance, was really struggling and didn't have a board or anything. And so we've revived that. And now I've gone from the Truckee Meadows Bicycle Alliance, which is in the Reno area, to the Nevada Bicycle Coalition. And we're reviving that and, and, and trying to do things statewide, like an Idaho stop legislation, possibly e-bike incentives, things of that sort, um, and supporting local uh, groups. So uh, Elko, for instance, uh, has been trying to put in a bike path. And they keep saying, Hey, can you put in a bike path? And the local officials say, yeah, we can do that. And they never do. So what is it that we can do to try and support that? And so we're going to the National Bike Summit. They're going to bring back a bunch of presentations um, and and give them throughout the state in smaller uh, communities. Um, down in Vegas, I, I, I rode there. I bike commuted for about 10 years um, from far north west uh, to the university uh, and to work, um, which involved crossing the strip every day, which is harrowing, incredibly dangerous and very, very difficult. And the, the roads are incredibly wide, like freeway size, just about everywhere and, um, and don't contain bike paths. Uh, downtown uh, Las Vegas, I think is, is probably the most progressive area and there may be some painted lanes ton of potential down there too like sitting you know theoretically in three years we'll see if it keeps the timeline but uh las vegas is going to be connected by the first kind of true high-speed rail modern high-speed rail in the country and i would love to be a part of kind of uh, fomenting a conversation around this is an incredible opportunity to be looking at land use policies around that area because las vegas like a lot of kind of mountain west cities just is defined by the sprawl that is uh you know it's doubled in size since the 90s or more than doubled, and and that's all been kind of exurban, uh, you know, out into the 
um, the natural areas around it. And I'll add too, um, hopefully we can connect at the National Bike Summit. I'm actually presenting. Oh, cool. Uh, coalition building. Uh-huh. And, um, and, and that, I think that, you know, that is also a lot of the potential that I see. You know, it's, it's a real opportunity when, when you have kind of an organization that did exist, that you're re- revitalizing, that you are able to look back on what did and didn't work, why maybe it fell apart. And look at the, you know, where within that, um, you know, again, where are those opportunities? Where can we be, you know, building out those coalitions? Because, yeah, Las Vegas, it's, you know, one of the busiest airports in the country. Most of those people are going, yeah, about a mile north to the Strip. And the fact that that isn't connected with, you know, uh, better, you know, mass transit is ridiculous. Uh, That would benefit everyone, including those taxi drivers. And, and, um because then they're not having to deal with, you know, the people who don't know where they're going and that are, you know, driving around and making that strip, that very wide roadway, not only dangerous for pedestrians and, and folks on bikes, but also for the drivers. Uh, I think that the, the, the that, that area the, has some of the highest rates in the state of uh, vehicle collisions. And, you know, most of those are, are low impact fender benders, but those are costs that are being absorbed by those taxi companies in one way or another. And I think that they would also be able to benefit from, um, you know, a more seamless uh, traffic pattern there. Yeah, fantastic. Well, Las Vegas is going to be lucky to have you for sure. So, uh, and and one of the things that we'd like to at the at the Nevada Bicycle Coalition is is try to absorb you, you know, if we can. And uh, and he, he yeah, might. appreciate that. Yeah, I think I'm joining a board meeting later this month. And the oh. other one too, uh, the League of American Cyclists, they or bicyclists, they uh, have a new certification, which is the, the advocate certification. And oh. there's only going to be 36 initially, um, and then I think that they're, they're that number gets up to like 50 total by the end of the year. But I'll be one of them, and I'll be moving out there with that certification. Kind of what what that means uh, is yet to yeah <laughs> yet to be determined. But um, you know, if nothing else, I, I hope that it can kind of be this you know rallying flag of like, hey, this person actually knows what they're talking about beyond just my experience of doing that work for you know, years here and uh, previously down in San Antonio. Wow! So you're like an official advocate. I yeah, whatever that means. <laughs> 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 yeah. yeah, it'll be great to connect. Uh, yeah, so we're also a pedestrian advocacy organization, and I think that the biggest the biggest target you can really go after on that one is jaywalking. And so that has some really obvious equity concerns. Many of us are still kind of um, you know, in a mindset of we need to be doing as a state more about racial justice, and that is one that every state that has done studies, extensive studies on it, uh, that the, the impacts are disproportionate and they fall along racial lines. Um, but beyond that, it's about kind of fomenting a conversation about how do we create these spaces, these public places? How are we ensuring that they are accessible for everyone, that um, that they are public and they're not just restricted um, you know, to one modality or another? And uh, what else? We're, we're hold, also working hold, on. Hold on. Before before you move on yeah. to the next thing, and what is it that you do about, about jaywalking? Do you make it not illegal or, or what? Yep. So we're still being debated currently. Um, Decriminalization is obviously a lot more um, straightforward than fully removing that from the books. Uh, We also, as a state, don't have uh, very strong jaywalking laws. Um, So we are kind of removing the element of it that relies on uh, relies on the pedestrian to to be responsible for everything that's happening. And with that, too. um, So we 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 have really low pedestrian fatality rates overall as a state. We rank much closer to kind of European countries um, in that regard. But there was a study that just came out of Florida that pointed to, um, we actually in fact have the highest uh, rate in the nation for um, pedestrian fatalities at intersections. And what that really points to for us is that, you know, maybe those intersections aren't actually the safest places for pedestrians to be crossing and that you know illegal behavior of crossing mid block or you know not at the intersection is often a better decision so a little bit like the Idaho stop which we talked about is you know this is giving um, people on bikes the freedom to make the choice that is safest for themselves this you know similarly for pedestrians is you know allowing them to behave in a way that um, you know, is true of that modality where you are able to have a lot more flexibility of movement. And how do we create a space, these public spaces, um, such that you know it, it doesn't prioritize one uh, kind of mode of transportation over the others? Yeah, excellent. And and you were about to go on to some others. 
Yep. So one of the things we also passed last year was uh, we mandated that our State Department of Transportation um, kind of enact a vehicle miles travel reduction, which is uh, you know, it has a lot of reasons to do it. It's a huge cost savings if we can do it. Um, it's also you know, one of the more impactful um, climate legislation, pieces of climate legislation you can be passing. Uh, unfortunately, that mandate didn't come a, with a lot of detail. So we're trying to kind of, we're trying to make sure that this actually happens, <laughs> I guess. Um, you know, ensure that our, our State Department of Transportation, the MnDOT, that they're, you know, actually a Department of Transportation, not just a Department of, you know, highways and freeways. Uh, and what we're looking at that with is, you know, how are they kind of equi equitably um, prioritizing in a funding structure um, all of these different modalities, and that includes mass transportation, because you know right now the the full share of everything that is not car infrastructure that they're funding is a you know less than seven percent of their total um, you know their total budget, and and that's just it's not a path forward uh, when we're thinking about. You know, we need to be reducing, especially those the shorter car trips, which are the majority of them, as much as possible. Uh, that we really do need to be looking at, like, okay, maybe you know, road highway expansion is not a tenable solution to that. Yeah. Huh. Neat. Uh, and so, yeah. what is it that um, uh, are you uh, asking for that legislation to be, or, or or that policy, or whatever it is, to be put in place, and then it kind of leaves it open to how they're going to reduce the miles that they can explore that on their own, or uh, it, it sounds like it's kind of open ended. It is a little bit open-ended, and we're borrowing some legislation from, I think, Washington State on this one, where they did say basically, you know, whenever you have a project, some portion of it needs to be allocated to pedestrian and bike uh, infrastructure, and that doesn't necessarily need to go in at the same location. It just needs to free up that funding to be, you know, shifted to a project that has been, you know, uh, that has been identified elsewhere. Huh. Yeah, um, kind of in addition to that, uh, some of the legislation we're working on right now, uh, uh, we're trying to get um, no turn uh, no turn on red added to our complete streets policy. So as those streets are updated to include bike lanes, that they're you know they remove that um, really dangerous uh, uh, point of conflict um, from being you know, legal um, in those spaces, and then also uh, red light um, enforcement uh, or trap uh, camera enforcement. Sorry, um, around speeding. Uh, is one that we already have someone who's wanting to uh, a sponsor of that as a bill and so we're trying to figure out you know what, what's the best path forward on that and we've been with that one also kind of networking with uh advocates all over the country uh we talked with someone from bike walk kc uh last week um and yeah he kind of put forward the idea that you know when you introduce something like this there's that equity component of you know is this being prioritized in spaces that are going to have disproportionate racial outcomes and so what he suggested for that one is you know when you introduce it make sure that there is an off-ramp to that effort uh so you know set goals of okay this is going in because you know uh, speeding incidents have been so high in this area or uh you know, there's traffic collisions happening at a disproportionate rate. And if we can reduce those either by, you know, automated ticketing or by, you know, using the data that's gathered from this, um, that uh, to justify built environment improvements, so, you know, traffic calming, and that's successful, the cameras get removed because they're not necessary anymore. Oh, neat. That's a, a, a great way of doing it. One of the things that we do on Bike Life Radio is that we tell a bike story, right? Uh, like a, a favorite one. Uh, do you do you have one that, that you would like to share? Uh, sure. Yeah. So the oldest rail to trail in the country is about an hour away from Rochester. Uh, it's on the Wisconsin side, and it uh, is kind of defined by these three tunnels, these three old rail tunnels, and these are kind of of an era where it was rock that was um, cut through by hand, you know, pickaxes, and uh, is held together by this masonry stone. And it's just an, such an incredible experience because the inside of it, the longest one is is a, uh, over a mile long and you can't see light on either side. And the whole thing, uh, because of the temperature difference, you end up, and it's a slight, um, one end is a higher elevation, so you end up with fog that's just kind of billowing through. And you get to kind of ride into that, and then you have to walk your bike through it, but you, that experience of turning off um, your bike lights 
Yeah, at, at just being in that space and listening to the water drip is just just unreal. And I think that there's so many of those those really hidden gems of uh, uh, trails all around the country. So I'm, I'm really excited to see what, uh, what what's available out in Nevada. Wow, yeah, that creates quite a mental image. Like um, Eric Noonan goes into the tunnel and, uh, you know, here comes the bike advocate and he comes out of this <laughs> billowing, uh, you know, fog uh, through a... Dripping wet, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it's great. It's, it, the doors too are just these like, massive... Um, like you feel like uh, you know one of the rings, something or another. Uh, yeah, it's just it's like uh, built by giants kind of thing. It's, it's very fantastic. Cool. All right, well, um, uh, I guess I'll see you next month then at uh, the National Bike Summit. Um, your the the title of your presentation is what? It's changed a few times, so I'm actually going to be paired with the other Rochester, uh, the original, and it's it's uh it's going to be about coalition building. But I think it, the the title is going to be the a Tale of Two Rochesters or something like that. That's uh, what they're, they're going with. Should be good though. I think that it's an interesting kind of juxtaposition of two cities. You know, they, theirs was really defined by a single um, corporate entity, and ours currently very much is uh, with the Mayo Clinic. And um, you know, that comes with pros and cons, and so it should be a really great discussion. All right. Well, we'll uh, we'll see you out there, and then uh, when are you coming here again to to Nevada? Uh, it should be in uh, late June or early July. All right. But I it might be before that. We'll see. We have been talking to Eric Noonan of We Bike Rochester. He's moving to Las Vegas and hopes to be an advocate uh, in Nevada as well. This is Bike Life Radio on KWNK. We're going to close out today's show with Luca Bloom de Roma. So I found myself thinking of this song again. I'd like to sing it for anyone who was stuck in traffic on the way to the show tonight. Yeah.
That's it for Bike Life Radio. If you would like to hear old shows of Bike Life Radio, go to KWNK on Spotify. Bike Life Radio rides our bikes out into the world, and we talk to people about their bikes and their lives. The show is made possible by NevadaBike.org, BikeWashoe.org, and KWNK in Reno, Nevada, owned and operated by the nonprofit bike shop, Reno Bike Project, on Grove Street. I'm Kai Plaskon. Right on. <laughs>